Welcome to the live radio show, Critical Mass Speaker Series, California State University, Long Beach, in front of a live audience. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Yeah, baby. We have an exciting show planned for you tonight, and we really appreciate you coming to the events here on the beautiful campus, as well as listening to us on the stream on octalkradio.net. Tonight's theme is curiosity, and curiosity is defined as a quality related to inquisitive thinking, such as exploration and learning, evident in observation in human and animal species. The late Yogi Berra once said, you can observe a lot by watching. Tonight we're going to explore the concept of curiosity to better understand the role it plays in one's life and professional career. To help me discuss the power of curiosity, we have two panelists. To my far left, Dean Michael Solt. He is the Dean of the Business School here at California State University, Long Beach. Give him a big round of applause. Also joining us tonight, we're very excited to have him as well here in the audience and on the panel is Will Pomerantz. He is Vice President, Special Projects, Virgin Galactic. <laughs> this is our college speaker series and I'm honored to be back on the campus of Cal State University Long Beach and we're streaming on octalkradio.net. This show will be available as a podcast on iTunes and your favorite podcasting software next week as well as from my website, criticalmassforbusiness.com. This is a discussion, ladies and gentlemen, designed to be interactive between the panel and me and the panel and you, our live audience. As I said, we have a microphone here for your use. Don't be shy. If the spirit moves you, just get up and come on down and we'll let you be a part of the live show as well. Let's get started. And I wonder if maybe we could ask if you could both tell us a little bit about your background and try to tie in the concept of curiosity and how it served you in your career. Um, Dean Salt, are you going to go first? Sure. <clears throat> well, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Rick, for inviting us to be here. Um, well, I've been dean of the business school here since 2008, and that's a little bit about my background. But before that, I was a professor of finance for many decades. For 17 years, I was a professor of finance at San Jose State, and for part of that time, I was an associate dean. And going way back, I was a little baby Buckeye nut in Ohio growing up, and by the time I got to college, I was a big Buckeye nut, or just maybe nutty for the Buckeyes, I don't know. Um, but throughout my academic career, I've been a teacher and a researcher, and I think that has tied in with uh, curiosity a lot. The research part is trying to do something new and original in my field, which was finance, that hadn't been done before. So that takes a lot of curiosity to think about that. And designing courses like New Venture Finance or International Finance, making them interesting for students, that made me curious about those subjects too. So curiosity has been part of my path, I, I believe. Give him a round of applause for being the first one to speak tonight. Will? Well, first of all, Rick, thanks for having, having me on the show, and thanks to Dean Soule for hosting us uh, today. I'm very happy to be here on campus, particularly during homecoming week. Um, in terms of my background, you know, uh, maybe it's because I moved around every couple of years when I was a kid, but I, I have always loved exploration. Um, you know, when, you, when you're sort of forced by circumstances of life to make all new friends and learn new types of food and everything every couple of years, uh, sometimes it gets a little bit addictive. So uh, personally, my life's goal has always been making it easier for people to explore outer space. Um, I've always wanted to go to space personally, but I found out when I was eight years old that I could never go because I have this terrible medical affliction called needing to wear glasses. So, yes, I will accept your pity for this horrible and rare affliction. Uh, I'm totally disabled by this. It's amazing. Um, but uh, that deterred me for a little while. But once I realized outer space, uh, space exploration was actually an industry that had real jobs, I got hooked into it. Uh, went and uh, got my academic degree in uh, Earth and Planetary Sciences. I spent a couple of years studying the geology of other planets. People used to pay me to sit around and look at pretty pictures of Mars and think deep thoughts, uh, which was spectacular. Um, but also a little bit frustrating because as a curious person, uh, curious person, I found it very um, unsettling that in that field, when you study another planet and you're a scientist and all you want is data, in that field you're very fortunate if you get a new data set once per decade. Uh, and you're always sort of one bad day away from skipping a decade. And that was not the pace of things that I was uh, well accustomed to. So I decided to go back to school and then uh, 
through various twists and turns in my career, really dedicate myself to letting there be more data sets, allowing more people from more different types of backgrounds, more universities, more private companies, more individuals to ask new questions about space and then go out there, whether it's going themselves or sending satellites, and go get answers to those questions. Give him a round of applause, please, Will Pomerantz. <laughs> As we began to put the show concept together, um, doing some background, if you haven't Googled this gentleman, I would encourage you to do it. Not now. We want no smartphones. Put those down. Hold on. But later this evening or sometime in the not too distant future. Um, and as I heard him speak and read about him, the idea of curiosity kind of came to us as to follow into the profession. How many of us go out and look up at the stars at night on occasion? Anybody in the audience do that? Is that not an amazing sight? Is that not an amazing sight? Yeah. Thank you. Amen, brother. Let's, <laughs> let's, get, let's make this work, all right? Just wondering what is there. And which got us thinking about, well, what if it's not something as vast and as potentially interesting as space? What if it's something like your career or your job? How do you bring that same sense of wonder? And is that important to bring that sense of wonder into your life, into your job? And are there advantages to that? And that's part of what we're going to discuss tonight. Not to get too heavy, we're going to have fun, but we're also going to have a serious conversation. So let's start by asking, Will, if you'll go first, what's your definition of curiosity? Uh, well, these days I have a different one. Uh, my wife works for NASA at the Jet Propulsion Lab, and she's a mission lead for uh, a robotic mission exploring Mars that is called Curiosity. So, uh, so Curiosity, in addition to other things, means uh, half of the income in our family, which is pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but more generally, I would say Curiosity mean, means just constantly asking questions and uh, actually caring about the answer to those questions. You know, there's some people who ask a lot of questions because it's a way to fill the time and make conversations less awkward, and I guess that's fine. Uh, but there are other people who ask questions and then will go and go back to their computer and spend 20 hours researching the dang thing just because they got the bug in their brain that, hey, there's something interesting out there and I want to go figure it out. Thank you. Dean Salt? <clears throat> well, I think curiosity is wanting knowledge, needing explanation, seeking answers. I think it's the inbred, uh, in, inborn, integral part of human nature. It sort of brings together our psyche and the, the real world around us. Um, to me, it's the link between our mental states and the real world. So in a lot of ways, it seems to me that curiosity is an action word. A uh, little quote from Walt Disney. He said, we keep moving forward, opening new doors, and doing, do, doing new things because we're curious, and curiosity keeps leading us down the road. So I think it truly is an action word. Thank you. All right. I would like you to give them both a round of applause again. I'm sorry, but we're going to just keep you moving. I know it's 6 o'clock, 6 something here in the evening. Hopefully you've gotten a little bit of food. If you're in the live audience, if you're listening to us on the stream, you could be walking around your house doing whatever is the right thing for you to do right now, maybe even having a drink. But that's fine with us. We don't mind as long as you're listening and participating. Um, what do you gentlemen think, or how do you think curiosity is important in a career? How do you think it shows up in someone's career? It doesn't have to be about space. Maybe some of you are going to proceed in that vein and in that industry. But overall, how do you respond to that question? Uh, I, it could not possibly be more important. Uh, it is something that we are absolutely looking for from the moment you first apply for a job at our company. And by the way, we're hiring. So I hope many of you will apply for a job at our company. Um, but uh, even once you make it in through the doors, uh, it is the thing that we require of you every day um, and nights and weekends also. Uh, you know, the curious employees are the ones who uh, don't only do what their manager directs them to do. And, and the fact of the matter is that no matter how amazingly virtuosic your CEO is and no matter how good your, your middle line managers are, uh, your manager will never tell you everything that you need to do. If, if, if he or she does, then there's probably, you, you haven't found the right company just yet. Um, I work at a company where we're encouraged, of course we have to do our work, but we're encouraged to ask other questions, to find new ways of doing things, to maybe even suggest entirely new things that perhaps we should be doing. Um, 
if we didn't have that, we would never have been born as a company. I mean, for goodness sakes, we're a company that's trying to be the world's first commercial space line. We're trying to make it so that anyone on the planet can go to space, so that everyone on the planet can build a satellite or, or some kind of research experiment and send that to space. You don't even start uh, a business that, on the surface of it, sounds kind of crazy, unless you're curious about, well, what the heck would happen if we, if we just announced this thing? Would anyone be interested in buying it? Uh, so yeah, it, and again, and that is certainly not limited to, to aerospace. I'll, I'll use, say this in the context of hiring, because I'm here at a university, and I suspect maybe some of you are looking for internships or jobs. Um, you know, when you, we come in, we're going to ask you questions about, um, not just about your grades, or what you've done at maybe past summer internships, or for a professor that you work for. I'm going to ask what you do in your spare time. I'm going to ask what your hobbies are. And what I want the answer to be is, well, uh, I was looking for this club, and, and Cal State Long Beach didn't have the club, so I started this club, and then we, uh, we built this project, and, and it doesn't have to be a rocket. If it's a rocket, that's great, and I know there's some cool rocketry projects here, but if it's, a, if it's a drone, if it's a model car, if it's an electric refrigerator, if it's an app, if it's a podcast, I want to know that you were curious about something, and you took some initiative, and you took some steps, and you stumbled perhaps along the way, but you were curious about why you stumbled, and you went off and fixed it. Thank you very much. Dean Salt? Well, I do think someone or anyone could have a career without being curious, but I do think the type of career or maybe the arc of the career really depends upon curiosity. Um, so I think curiosity can be a great boost to a career. Uh, to me, business sort of goes between two anchors, you know, standardization and uniqueness, rational processes and extra rational processes really consistent business processes or disruptive processes. And I think, um, well, think about the 200 years ago, we had the Industrial Revolution that brought us factories, assembly lines, cheaper products, but it turned people into things like cogs in a machinery of a manufacturing process or a bureaucracy. Now, someone had to have the idea for, and the curiosity, to come up with the cotton gin, the steam engine, or the, the railroad train, the, um, the locomotive, but business turned them into consistent, rational, standard processes. So I think there is this difficulty of trying to be unique, yet build something that is maybe scalable. And to me, that's a big word today, scalable. That just turns things into standardized and consistent processes. So there is this, this tendency for business to drive out curiosity. But I do think that in today's world, for all of you out there who will be working at Virgin Galactic or interning at Virgin Galactic, I think it's not enough just to think that you can be a cog in a wheel. You have to be something more. Uh, I was at a conference a couple years ago, and I heard Thomas Friedman speak, in, you know, the earth is, the world is flat, Thomas Friedman. And he talked about how in earlier times, sort of like for maybe us baby boomers, it was good enough to meet expectations, you know, meet the job expectations or the manufacturing expectation or the company expectation overall. In other words, you could be successful at sort of being average. But he says today that's not the case. And what I heard Will say is that's definitely not what Virgin Galactic wants. They want people who are constantly questioning and thinking all the time. And that's sort of what Thomas Friedman told the audience. He said that everyone needs to try to be above average or not average is maybe a different way of saying it. Uh, and I think that curiosity can be a piece of that puzzle that can help an individual become more than average. You're listening to the Critical Mass Radio Show. This is our college speaker series. We're at California State University in Long Beach, and we're in live audience on a school night. But it's Thursday, and if I've heard correctly, Thursday night is now the start of the weekend for the college set. Is that true? Is that when we can start partying tonight? Is the homecoming rally, pep rally going on here later this, after this event? So, so we don't want to keep you from that fun. Um, anybody, anybody in the audience have children? Anybody in the audience been a child? Yes. Okay, <laughs> great. I think, think back to one of the most common words that children use when they're starting to discover the world, which is why. Why, right? How many times do we have to answer? How curious are we in our early forms of what we are and what we become? Well, I'm struck that in your industry, you talked about it, and a lot of curious people go into that, craving something, learning something that isn't known yet. Do you see any 
common traits that are inherent in the people that populate your industry in particular? Sure, definitely. You know, I, I feel incredibly fortunate to work in an industry that almost everyone in the world likes. You know, I, I go around the world, I give a lot of presentations, I get a chance to talk to people of all ages, and almost no one's bored by space exploration. Uh, you know, it, I would have a very different career if I was having to go get people excited about maybe some other products that are on the market. But when you're talking about, yeah, you could go to space, it's pretty easy to, to get people fired up about it. Um, and obviously that extends to the employees. Um, everyone in our building, whether they're working reception or they're the rocket scientists tw tweaking the engines, uh, are pretty passionate about their jobs. Uh, and that shows when you're passionate about your job, you're not just there to, to stamp a time card and to, uh, to watch the clock spin around for eight hours or nine hours. Um, those are the, the people who are reading the extra books in their spare time. They're, they're following on with every mission that's going on at any other company. Because we, uh, I think we're a pretty unique company in what we're doing, but we're certainly not the only company in the business. There's NASA, there's SpaceX, there's you know, country, other countries. Um, they're the ones who are fully up to speed on all those missions, and they're sort of looking at each of them saying, ooh, how do we top that? How do we make something like that, but more applicable to our customers, or even better? Or how do we bring that process into the building and allow it to make this a more fun place to work, a safer place to work, a healthier place to work, whatever it is? So uh, it's that combination of passion and curiosity, which I think are pretty fundamentally linked. It's hard not to be curious about something you're passionate about. You know, it, it doesn't matter to me whether it's a, a, a career or a band or a sports team. You know, if you're a fanatic about a band, You've read the Wikipedia page, you've watched the documentary, you own every album, you've downloaded the bootlegs, like you are curious, you want all, all of the data. You've, you're doing pretty well in life if you can find a job that you feel like that about, where, again, you're not in a race to get home, you're kind of the opposite. When you get home, you wanna learn more about it. Thank you very much. We have one more question, then we're gonna take our first commercial break here on Critical Mass Radio Show on our college speaker series. And it's for you, Dean. Are you observing any changes in how students at the school satisfy their curiosity? Well, I think there's a lot of difference between students today and students of earlier times. I'm not sure that curiosity is that difference, to tell the truth. Um, as I see students today, they're extremely busy in very, very, very many ways. They're plugged into a lot of things say it's educational things, work things, social things, and it seems like a lot more plugged into things than I was as, a, as an undergraduate. Um, but I don't know if, if they're really more curious. I think there's higher expectations in some ways for students today. I think the bar for getting into college might be higher. I've, I've run into a lot of parents and friends who say, gee, I have a great career, life, and family, but I don't know if I could get into XYZ University today. Um, but on the other hand, I think there are some things that are the same for all students throughout time. I think students today, to be successful, need to be dedicated and diligent, committed to their work, um, work hard, take responsibility, and be accountable. I think those things have not changed throughout time. But I do think that some students have always been curious. Um, just like today, there are some students who, who are curious. Um, if I have a couple yeah. seconds. Um, so, but curiosity doesn't seem to be a difference because I think students, like always, are way too busy. They're busy worrying about their next exam, their next uh, project, their next set of readings. Uh, and maybe they're need building that base of knowledge from which to be curious. And they're also maturing as people. So it's not a knock on today's students. But I could say one thing I would like for today's students is maybe try and, and uh, work into depth, more depth on certain subjects and get immersed in things and dig deeper. And I think curiosity would come as a way of that. So if I could see students become deeper in some areas instead of having a, a Wikipedia-like knowledge of everything, that would be one thing I would like. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to take our first commercial break. When we come back, we're going to start the conversation with this thought. How is technology, in your observation, Will, in your industry, and Dean Salt, in your profession, affecting curiosity? Is it enabling or is it having an adverse effect on it? We're going to start with that and then we're going to open the floor up to some of you here in the audience. So, anybody have a question? Raise your hand if you think you might have a question. Show me your hands. Come on. A couple more. Okay, good. We've got a few brave souls to start. Always takes a few brave souls, doesn't it? All right, we're going to take our first break here on, commercial, on Critical Mass Radio Show. 
Welcome back to this edition of Critical Mass Radio Show. We're live from California State University, Long Beach. We got a packed house tonight. And it's a school night. And they're out to learn about curiosity. And we're, as I said, we're going to open it up to the floor in just one minute. But before we get there, before the break, uh, I mentioned that we were going to talk about curiosity and how technology is impacting it, both positively and maybe in a, in a not so positive way. So, um, Will, are you comfortable with starting this? Sure. What's your sense of that? Please? Yeah, I, I think it's helped massively. I suppose there are some downsides. It's easier to get distracted and, and sort of say, ooh, shiny thing, and, and never pour yourself too deeply in, into, into one subject. But I would say, on balance, technology has massively helped us, as all of us, I imagine, in every career, as, we, uh, as you enable people's curiosity. You know, the, the fact of the matter is, um, if any of you have a smartphone, of course, all of you have smartphones. I'm on a college campus. You all have five or six smartphones, presumably. You know, you, you have access to more information than uh, President Clinton had access to throughout his entire presidency, wow. right? And it, it costs you like $50 a month or, or something. It's a pretty spectacular thing. It means that whatever you get interested in, you can really delve into. Um, you can uh, supplement your coursework here by watching Khan Academy videos or edX or Coursera. You can connect with an expert. You can go online and say, you know, I've gotten really curious about uh, what's going on in the world of venture capital in China and say, oh my god, I, I know somebody who studies that and I, it's easy for me to email him or just contact him on Twitter or something. We, we can connect about that. Um, and it's easy to even to sort of find other people with like-minded interests, which always allows you to sort of take the power of one person and turn it into a, a collaborative effort. You know, nowadays, whenever I give talks about space exploration, uh, I always like to end with a little bit of a call to action. Um, and I like to reference this, this website I, I discovered, a friend of mine launched it. I, I don't have anything to do with it. I don't make any money off it or anything. I just think it's really cool. There's this website called spacehack.org. Um, and all it is is a list of, it's a rolling list, but it's typically about 30 different projects where anyone in the world can actively contribute to space exploration. And it does not require a, a PhD. You don't have to have 2020 vision. You don't need to have 10,000 hours in the cockpit of a fighter jet. You need a computer and an internet connection, or maybe a smartphone and internet connection. And you can be applying whatever your particular skills are um, to, to space exploration. You can be helping, uh, you know, classify old images from telescopes to say, hey, this thing looks like it might be a galaxy and maybe a professional astronomer can look at it. You can uh, help write business plans for people who are trying to come up with new space businesses. You can write software. You can go through old historical archives of NASA's earliest days of human spaceflight and you can transcribe things or translate them into other languages. I mean, there's a hundred different ways. Uh, I imagine if you had been interested in those things 50 years ago, you know, you would have had to take a a plane down to Texas and try and get access to the library at the Johnson Space Center, and that would have taken you a month to do that, and then maybe that would have given you another thing. And you could have can maybe connected those dots, but in your lifetime, you could have assembled like three dots in a row. You can do all of that in the course of like uh, a two-hour binge session sitting on your couch instead of watching the next episode of House of Cards or something. Uh, you can get an amazing amount done. So I think technology has made me more curious, but has also enabled me to sort of satisfy some of those curiosity, which just always leads to the next question. If I could have a follow-up question with you, Will, before we ask you, Dean, to answer that question. Um, one of the uh, videos that I saw, one of the talks that you gave, you ended with um, suggesting that technology has lowered the risk of of exploration of space. That I think you said if something goes wrong, you're not in front of the Senate yeah. or a subcommittee. Yeah. You're talking to your investors about why the Kickstarter campaign didn't go off. Yep. But from your perspective, how has technology made that even made space exploration even more possible? Yeah, uh, there are many fields, and space exploration, space exploration is one of them where. Uh, it can be hard in some ways to indulge curiosity just because there's so much time and money involved in trying something, right? It, it, it's difficult to um, dip your toes into the world of superconducting super colliders or something like that because you need a couple billion dollars to build one. Uh, and space certainly used to be one of those fields, right? For example, just to ground you all with some, some financial numbers, uh, every single flight of NASA's space shuttle, not, not the development of the vehicle, every single flight cost about $1.3 billion. Depends a little bit how you calculate the numbers, but it's in that billion plus range. So it's hard to say, hmm, I'm curious about space. Uh, let's, uh, can we just, let's do a space shuttle mission. Um, that's starting to change now. You're getting to the point where you can do real experiments and you can spend, you know, 
ten thousand dollars. And maybe that's not something you do in a moment of idle curiosity as an individual, but maybe that is something you do in a moment of idle curiosity as a member of the faculty uh, here at a university. You know, you can write a grant and get ten thousand dollars and build a CubeSat and fly it into space and learn something that no one's ever known before. Uh, it also means that you can, when it, when it gets that much easier, you kind of ask dumber questions because the consequences of failure are different. And, and of course, it's really hard many times to tell in advance which questions are dumb and which questions are smart. There are lots of questions that seemed dumb at the time and then you know, totally revolutionized our world. Like, you know, w why does it look like this mold killed all these bacteria? Oh, that's penicillin. <laughs> oh, that's gonna save a billion people. It probably seemed like a dumb question at first. Why is this guy asking about molds all the time? Um, when it doesn't cost you a billion dollars and you don't have to plead for the United States President and the United States Congress to agree on something for once, but you can just go and do a Kickstarter campaign or you can get one member of faculty to give you a little bit of spare money or you can go and ask your friends and family to let you borrow their computers to assemble them together or find a maker space or whatever else it is. Uh, it just allows people to try those crazy ideas that turn out to be brilliant. Thank you. Dean, would you like to talk about the impact of technology on curiosity? Well, we're, I'd be happy to. It's, we're in a real exciting time in the, in the universities right now. I think uh, we tend to, to have an educational model that probably hasn't changed much for 800 years. Uh, someone stands up on the stage and professes things to students, and students duly listen as long as they can stay awake and then go home and supposedly reflect on it and come back. That model is it's done a lot for our, um, it did put a man on the moon and things like that, but I think right now we're at a much more exciting time and it's because of technology. We're actually flipping things around and our provost loves to call it the flip classroom. Instead of the classroom being the time for lecture and the non-classroom time being the time for doing homework, that's being flipped through videos, um, other online uh, resources, students before they come to class can do a lot of preparation. And then that valuable time in the classroom is one where questions can be asked, whether they're good questions, not good questions, smart questions, dumb questions. It, it allows a whole lot more interaction. Now to me, like I said, curiosity is an action word, so by providing this different type of educational model, it can actually open up the minds of students to learn more about this subject and really get a deeper and better, better knowledge that way. Thank you very much. Okay, time for applause for both of the panelists. You're listening to Critical Mass Radio Show. This is our college speaker series. We're at California State University, Long Beach. And we've asked for members of the audience who might have a question for one of the panelists to line up, and a few of them have. So would you come to the mic, tell us your name, and ask your question. Give him a round of applause for being brave. Hello, my, na my name is Miguel Quintero. I'm a, a business student here. Uh, my question is, in this world where we have many things standardized, such as testing, how do you think, based on your personal experience or your life, how do you think we can create that environment where we can foment, where we can nourish the curiosity in students? Yeah, that's a very difficult uh, problem because, as you know, we, when you're in your class, you're with 20, 30, 40, or even more students at one time. So how do we provide a consistent level of education for everyone? Um, I think technology is actually providing some new solutions there too. I think there are uh, different sort of um, testing options that can generate different questions for each student and that student can then take those, those uh, exams or quizzes by themselves. So I think by using more technology, we'll be able to allow individual differences to come through more. I'm happy to add a little bit. I, I was really fascinated by what Dean Solt was talking about in terms of the flipped classroom, which I think is this totally intriguing trend. Uh, not enough time perhaps has passed for us to measure the results, but I think that they're going to be phenomenal. And I think they're really going to help with exactly this problem. You know, in any industry, you need some standards. Everyone needs a common vocabulary for no, to know how to talk about the problems. So if you're all watching the same video or you're, you're operating from the same book, that allows you to quickly pick up the things that are required that are standard, and then you can spend your time with the faculty member or the graduate student or your fellow undergraduate student and explore and ask those questions and start to get into the weird and funky and silly things uh, where the non-standard but, but important stuff happens. So I, I'm, I don't know how it's gonna turn out, but I'm excited about it. 
I think we're on a good trend. I think yeah. it's here to stay. I agree. But thank you. No, thank you. Would uh, another question from the audience? Please come on down. Tell us your name and ask the question. Give him a round of applause. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. My name is Riley Dunn. I'm an aerospace engineering student here. Uh, I just had a question. We've talked a lot about technology and innovation and curiosity tonight. So I know Virgin Galactic focuses its ambitions right now on getting people in a low Earth orbit for space tourism, commercial space flight. I'm wondering with new technologies that have opened up, if Virgin Galactic has set its sights on anything beyond just low orbit uh, commercial space flight, any, any things pertaining yeah. to space exploration or yeah. scientific ventures? Solid question. Um, we're definitely thinking about it. You know, we're pretty busy on, on our first two projects, on, on our human spaceflight program with Spaceship Two and our small satellite launch program with Launcher One. Each of those is pretty hard in, in and of itself. Um, and I think also each of those things is pretty significant, both in terms of generating some financial returns, but also in terms of like making this world a better place and a more interesting place. Um, but neither of them is the end game for us. We certainly want to do more. Uh, we work for a guy, Sir Richard Branson, our founder, is you know, one of the most curious people I've ever met. He's always asking, how can we do this better, and what could we do new, and why haven't we done it yet? Why can't we do it tomorrow? Um, so he is always sort of challenging us to think about what comes next. It, it's one reason I like the fact that we, we give our vehicles these kind of uncreative names like Spaceship One, Spaceship Two, Launcher One. It implies that someday there will be a Spaceship Three and a Spaceship Four. Um, and I don't want to oversell it. We're not like secretly designing in a hangar somewhere Spaceship 3, but we've thought a little bit about what should Spaceship 3 do? What should Launcher 2 do? What, what, what should Spaceship 10 do, uh, you know, two decades from now or whatever it is? Uh, it's important to be thinking a little bit about those now, not to the extent that it's a distraction, but enough that it allows you to make better decisions today. You know, as you look at all of your decisions, whether it's a make-buy decision about whether we do this in-house or we contract it out, or maybe it's a decision, you're an aerospace engineer, it's a decision about, you know, what propellant should we use for our, for our liquid rocket engines. Um, you make different decisions sometimes uh, if the project you're working on is the only project you will ever work on, versus if you're trying to build up an experience base and intellectual property base that will allow you to take a stepping stone approach and, and go from there to somewhere else. So, so I think uh, if you ask Richard, he would love us to be not just doing the already pretty awesome things we are doing, but having hotels on the moon and you know sending people all over. There, there's a reason we're not called Virgin Near Earth Space, we're Virgin Galactic. Um, he wants us to be doing all that stuff now. And it, it is always finding this balance about fulfilling your curiosity about those other things without, um, without distracting yourself too much from the, the job at hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank him. Thank you. We're on a roll. Come on down. Tell us your name, please. Hi, my name is Angelo Cabanban. I am an accounting major um, over here, obviously. Um, my question is, may sound really silly and stupid, but um, with the advance of technology, you know, years ago, we wouldn't even think this was possible. Now, in fiction, you know, we always have you know, what our ideal of what space or whatever it is is going to be. Now, do you think that it would be closer to Star Wars or Star Trek? You know, like, no, because, I mean, like, there's things that could be plausible, like yeah. the O'Neill Cylinder yeah. as, like, a space colony or something like that. Uh, I, I guess I would say, at least I hope it's Star Trek. I feel like that's a, that, that ends better for <laughs> most people. Now, nah, nah, why not Star Wars? I, I, I'm not commenting on which one I enjoy more, okay, but if, no, I, if I was... If I was to be charting out the future of humanity and I had to pick one of those, I'd say less Emperor Pal Palpatine. Okay, so you're more, more for the um, rebel yeah. lines. More, the, more, more than, yes. Sure right, yeah. your contract yes. goes out That's a fair assessment as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, no Thank you, Angelo. Hi, my name is Joseph Walsh. I'm an accounting and information systems double major here. Um, Will, you stress facilitating space exploration. What do you see as some of the biggest obstacles in the industry? And where can motivated students transitioning to the workforce focus their curiosity to help overcome these obstacles? Good questions. Uh, in terms of uh, where can students focus their curiosity, there are tons of ways. Uh, one is that website I listed earlier, spacehack.org. Uh, another one is, um, 
a, uh, there's a student organization that I am chair of the board of advisors for uh, called the Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. They have chapters at about 50 universities and colleges across the United States, as well as many more in other nations. To the best of my knowledge, there's not currently a chapter here. I would love for there to be one. I will happily pay your, uh, your annual dues for your first year. Granted, that's 25 bucks, so I'm not being that generous. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but that's a great way because not only will that help you recruit other like-minded students you know, who are in this room or who are elsewhere on campus getting ready for homecoming weekend and find people where you can match your accounting and information systems background with the previous question askers aerospace engineering background with you know, all the other people in the room and, and assemble a team. But you can also sort of do similar things from university to university. And you could say, okay, here at Cal State Long Beach, we're really good at these things, but maybe we don't have departments in these other areas, so let's go find another school that does this. Uh, I would, I would highly encourage you to, to start one of those. Um, I think the, uh, the resumes of people who are active in those, uh, or the, the, sorry, the career track records of people who are, who are active in those clubs are pretty good. The career trackers of people who start those chapters are extraordinarily good. So it, uh, it reflects well on the individual or individuals who do that. Can you remind me of the first part of your question? Oh, it was just, um, what do you see as some of the biggest obstacles Got in it. the industry? Yeah. Um, you know, m many things, well, it, there's, there's many different parts of the space industry, you know, which is one of the exciting things. We like actually have a division of labor. This basic economic principle that's existed for, I don't know, a couple thousand years has finally come to the most advanced high-tech industry in the world or near the world. Uh, it used to be there was one game in town. It was the government. Uh, and your choice about working in space was, do I want to work for NASA or do I want to work for the DOD? Um, now there are different options, and they each have their own challenges. Uh, for NASA, I think its biggest challenge is that um, they have, you know, 539 bosses. They, they, they work for the United States Congress and for the president, and particularly lately, those groups don't seem to agree very much. And even when they do agree today, there's no guarantee they're going to agree with each other two years from now or four years from now or eight, certainly not eight years from now. Um, and in space, when a lot of the missions take eight years to put together, that, that's a huge challenge. Um, so I am a huge fan of NASA. I fundamentally think they can tackle any challenge we throw at them, as long as you don't just keep throwing new challenges at them and tell them to stop working on the one they were working on before they've had time to fix it. That's their biggest challenge. Um, from our side, to take Virgin Galactic as a specific example, you know, we, uh, we have the great fortune. Uh, I'll borrow a, a quote uh, from Sir Isaac Newton. You know, he talked about, if I have seen further, it's because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. We are absolutely standing on the shoulders of giants, and, and those giants are NASA, the United States Air Force, Boeing, you know, the European Space Agency, all, all these other things. Um, if you look at what we're doing and you break it down into components, everyone has done, at least, at least one organization has done every single one of those components before. What we're trying to do is put them all together in a package that all works well together. And in aerospace, like a lot of engineering fields, everything is connected. If you decide you want to make the rocket engine 10% more powerful, you're not just changing the rocket engine. You're got to make the tanks a little bigger. Okay, now the tanks are bigger, which means the fins need to be bigger, which means to be the structures, blah, 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 blah. Every, everything changes. So it's finding a way of balancing all of that while keeping it affordable. That's the other, that's the big challenge we have that the government often doesn't have. You know, NASA gets about $18 billion a year, every single year, they always will. It'll go up 1% or down 1%, but it's never gonna change too much, which means they can think about these really ambitious programs and they don't have to optimize for every thousand dollar decision, it kind of isn't, isn't worth their time. Well, for us, that's absolutely worth our time because a thousand dollars makes an enormous difference both to us and, and to our end customers. So finding a way to solve that kind of systems engineering problem um, while not letting the price tag run up is, is, I would say, the number one challenge for us. Thank you. Great conversation. Thank you very much for your question. Let's give everybody a round of applause. We have a few minutes and I love the fact that we have this much interest. Uh, please come up. Let us know your name and ask your question. Uh, my name's Will Hovick. I'm a mechanical engineering student here at Gossie Long Beach. And my question is to both of you, uh, Will and Dean Solt, what type of special projects have you been critically involved with that have made either a, uh, an impact on the company you work for or your personal life? <clears throat> well, we, I think he'll have a much in, more interesting answer. Uh, the interesting things I have done have just been working with colleagues on different research projects, and I guess the signal there is the quality of the journals. So I've been lucky enough to hit some couple pretty good journals in my career. Uh, so it's been a great personal 
success for myself or personal satisfaction for myself. Also, I lead a great college here on campus. Uh, we've been reaccredited a couple of times since I've been here, and our faculty continue to work hard developing new programs. We have a new Master of Science of Accountancy, new Master of Science of Supply Chain Management. Um, so, we, so I guess, to me, that's the biggest impact. If, um, <clears throat> if curiosity has to do with being dynamic and change, then I think uh, the impact I've had on the college probably is something I'm very proud of. Um, I've tried to build my career around doing special projects. Um, if for no other reason than I, I realized uh, when I'm working on a regular project, I do a bad job. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of the main reasons I mentioned earlier at the, at the top of the program, you know, my academic background originally was in planetary science, which is a cool field. I wasn't a very good planetary scientist um, because it wasn't keeping me engaged and my mind would wander and I would find myself you know, surfing the web or, or doing whatever else at work rather than, uh, rather than fully applying myself. Uh, I discovered through various twists and turns in both an academic and a professional and a personal career that uh, where I do best is uh, attacking a totally new problem where nobody knows how to do anything. And where my job is not to get a 100% perfect score, my job is to go from like zero to 80 very quickly and then to find that other person who can take it from 80 to 100. Uh, that's why I would make a really poor engineer, frankly, because like, often I think the engineering job is uh, okay is not acceptable. You have to go and make this perfect, and that takes an, in an incredible type of brain of which I, I greatly admire the people who can do that. So, uh, so yeah, kind of every step along the road, I, I have trying to find the way, where can I take this weird thing that no one knows what they're doing with and kind of fake it until I make it and then, uh, and then hand it off to someone else. At Virgin Galactic, I, I gotten to be part of that a couple times. I was, um, you know, I'm part of a relatively small team that has started up all the products that we do other than space tourism. Space tourism existed well before I joined the company. Uh, but now, in addition to space tourism, we fly uh, research payloads suborbitally to space. We've started an entire new program called Launcher One, which is a small satellite launch vehicle based right here in Long Beach, where we're employing 100 and 150 people or so, uh, and that was one of those ideas that was a sketch on a napkin, and I got to take it from sketch on a napkin to something a little bit more substantive before handing it off to, to folks such as yourself. Thank you very much, Will, and Will. Thank you, guys. All right. Come on down. How are we doing? Great. My name is uh, Jimmy Borland, um, class of 14 alumni here, business administration and marketing. And this question is uh, to both Dean Soule and Will. The question is, Planetary Resources recently came out with an article stating that the U.S. Senate just passed the U.S. Launch Competitive Act of 2015. How does this impact the future of uh, not for just space exploration as a whole, but for also Virgin Galactic and human mankind? I was going to read that tonight. It was on my desk. I, just did, I didn't get a chance to look at that. So. Um, it's a good thing. You know, if you look at the commercial space industry, this emerging entrepreneurial commercial space industry, there are a few exceptions, but it is almost entirely in the United States. And there are a couple reasons for that. One is access to venture capital, of which my colleague could answer, tell you far more about than I could ever dream of. Uh, one is the talent pool coming out of our universities uh, and schools and community colleges and everything else. Um, but another big part of it specific to aerospace is the regulatory base. Um, if, you, if I had, if, uh, if I lived in almost any other country in the planet and Santa Claus came to me and handed me a perfectly working Spaceship Two vehicle and all of the parts that I would need to maintain it and blueprints and flight manuals and everything else, it would be illegal to fly almost everywhere on the planet except for the United States. Uh, the US took a real leadership role uh, not often something you hear members of industry talking about regulators do. The regulators exercise an incredible amount of foresight in our industry, for which we are eternally grateful, and said, hey, this is coming down the pipeline. It's not here yet, but it's coming down the pipeline. They need some regulatory basis to work with, because if you don't have any of that, it's actually it's quite hard to convince an investor to, to, to drop a lot of money into your crazy harebrained idea if, if it's currently illegal and has no path to become legal. Uh, so, so Congress had, been, uh, had had enough foresight on this stuff. There were a few tweaks that were needed, and also there were some existing provisions that needed to be extended because the industry has moved a little more slowly than, than people expected. And so I think that that's, that's largely what that bill will focus on. It does a, a lot of things, and I have not read it in its entirety by any stretch of the imagination, but, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a good thing, and I, I hope that it, uh, 
there are versions that have passed both House and Senate. I hope that they conference and, and, and pass the full bill pretty soon. Well, what's interesting is part of the article states that um, it actually not only encourages for a space exploration, but it also states that there will be no human interference. <laughs> what do you think about that? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I am super familiar with those specific clauses, but I, I know that, um, again, this is one of those areas of real foresight where, where this bill doesn't just talk about the activities that are like happening imminently, such as what we're doing at Virgin Galactic or what SpaceX is doing up the street and in partnership with NASA and other organizations. They're also talking about things that are a little further afield, like um, property rights on other planets which are important if you're trying to build an asteroid mining company like Planetary Resources. You know, I think even the, the folks at Planetary Resources, which by the way is a spectacular company I'm a huge fan of and full of brilliant people, uh, even they will tell you the, the, the time when they actually go to an asteroid and land on it and extract resources is still pretty far out, right? They, first they have to find, first they have to build the, the telescopes that find the asteroids and then they have to build the other things that go and visit the asteroids and identify the site. So, so it's like a couple of technology generations away. Um, Congress didn't need to pass that. It wasn't, they weren't people banging down the door saying, I'm here, I've got my pickaxe, let me go. Uh, but they, uh, they did show that foresight again and I think it's gonna be really helpful to companies like Planetary Resources. Thank, Thank you, Jimmy. <clears throat> Give him a round of applause. Oh, Dean Salt, yes. I, I really haven't heard of that particular act, but listening to Will talk, I still think there's this sort of drumbeat or heartbeat between disruption, uniqueness, and innovation, and standardization and consistency. I think, and you've even hinted at the investors, so I think ultimately you want to be able to have a process that you can launch rockets again and again. So you, you do want that sort of consistency, even though it requires a curiosity of Richard Branson on down to be able to do that. Uh, so the question about um, this, this thing before Congress is about regulation. And I, I think if you turn on Fox News, you'll get a view that regulation is all bad. Um, and maybe if you turn on MSNBC, you might hear that how great re le legislation and regulation is. So I guess even though I'm a business school dean and a finance professor, I think we do need regulation. We do need to have some framework to have some sort of standardized processes that we can count on, that we that investors can put their money in, that uh, customers or clients can can get on board and take those those space trips, whether it be suborbital to the moon or beyond. Thank you very much. We have time for two more questions, and luckily we have two people standing to ask questions. So your name is? Hi, my name is Leah Villarreal. Um, I'm an international business major. Thank you too so much for being here. Um, I feel like I almost have too much curiosity. I am fascinated by so many things like space and countries and culture and food and everything. So I feel like sometimes there's an issue of finding your passion because you are fascinated by a lot of things. So does it just take time, experience, more curiosity and digging to find you know, what you really, like that specific thing that you really, really want to do? That, that would be my view, look, you know, from my own path through life and watching students and colleagues. Um, <clears throat> it, it's hard to just, roll the dice and know exactly what that passion is. So I do think it takes experience, it takes some uh, gathering of information, but at some point, I think you, for better or worse, have to pursue down a path. If that path doesn't work, you don't have to be locked in. You have to be willing to, to say, well, I'll, I will try something else. But I, I think uh, focusing the, the passion is the way to really get curiosity to pay off. It's a extremely good question. I, I'm probably not the best to answer. I don't know if it's like a behavioral economist or a psychologist or whomever else would be, but uh, I, my personal take would be uh, it's a good thing to be curious about too much. Like your, your brain has dealt you a good set of cards if that is the case, but it can have negative effects if you let it run amok. Uh, it does take some time and probably uh, a few instances where you put your hand on the metaphorical stove and you get burned, uh, to develop the discipline and say, okay, there are not enough hours in the day for me to do each of these things. I need to pick a few to be excellent with. And that's not to say I can't change my mind and do something different next year or next semester or next decade. Uh, but like, let me pick a few of these things and get really good because by doing those things, um, you will probably learn whether that you actually like them as much as you think you do. I would highly encourage you to use this time when you're in school, when you're young, 
Um, I don't know everyone's family situation, particularly particularly if you are maybe unmarried, you don't have kids yet, you're relatively speaking kind of debt-free-ish. Um, <laughs> it will never be easier for you to sample things and learn that you secretly hated them, <laughs> that you never knew, right? I, I uh, When I was young, I, I had internships at a few places where I, growing up, always thought I desperately wanted to work. I desperately wanted to work at NASA, and I desperately wanted to work at the United Nations. Uh, and I got internships at both of them, and I could not get out of there quickly enough. Even though I still love those organizations, and I support them, and I think they're fantastic, they were not a good fit for me, personally. Uh, and I would never have known that just by reading about them. I might have learned that by talking to people who work there, but the easiest way was just to go and get an internship. It's like a free trial period uh, where there's no one's hurt, feelings are hurt if you leave at the end. And they don't pay you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Some of them don't. Um, so uh, if you are, if everyone's financial circumstances are different, but if you, uh, if you are in a position where you can find a way to dabble as a volunteer, as an intern, as a whatever else, uh, now's the time to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. We'll ask, uh, give a round of applause, yes. Final question for this segment on Critical Mass Radio Show. Your name is? My name is Stephanie Chang, and I am a, a student in the College of Business, uh, folk concentrating in accounting, uh, also a member of Beta Alpha Psi and Accounting Society. And I, um, building off of what Will said about in regards to sampling, um, my background is actually, I started out at UC Davis back in 2010 and 2011 ending my last semester with the, um, the whole pepper spray incident. Mm -hmm. So my question is, today there, were, um, there was a strike or a protest of sorts going on, raising awareness about um, things that are happening on campus that not necessarily everybody knows about. And I actually happened across a group of high school students from an AVID program. And they were just standing by the uh, water fountains trying to figure out what's going on as this huge group of students are um, walking through the campus with signs, with microphones, with, um, with things to share. So um, what I was trying to do was encourage the high school, it turned out he was a high school teacher who is in charge of the program there to encourage them to, yes, be curious to, um, if they want to take photos, if they want to take videos, if they want to post it to Instagram, Facebook, whatever they want, um, that it's up to them to encourage that curiosity. But what's your take on um, curiosity and social media um, in regards to awareness on maybe campus matters? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, this is uh, back to the technology, the, the, the ever expanding, ever improving technology. So that's just a means for communication. Um, I, so I think, in general, it, it can be good, um, but it, it really, I guess, the bound, you have to be careful of, of not exceeding your own personal boundaries so that in the future you come back and make sure that you're happy with the things that you have posted. But to me, social media just helps bring connections among all of us more easily, more readily, and more universally. I, I mean, I, it's far outside of my area of expertise, but... Uh, it's clear just as a curious person who reads the news, it has power, right? We learned that this week pretty dramatically in Missouri, and you've learned that at other universities, but also in you know, non-democratic regimes all around the world. Uh, there are, clearly is power there. I won't use that old line about with great power comes, et cetera, et cetera, but, uh, um, but that is pretty true. <laughs> uh, so I, I think it is a tool to, to absolutely be used, and uh, it's, now's a good time to experiment with how to harness it. And if I could just conclude really quick that I was actually quite impressed with how Cal State was handling it, that nothing was, at least when I was there, was spir spiraling out of control to um, emanate what happened back at UC Davis four years ago, at around the same time. So that's all I've had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. All right, give a round of applause to everybody who came up and asked a question. We had nine questions from the audience. It filled the entire segment. I want to thank you very much. It's the, it's the power of the peer group asking questions. Hopefully there are some of you that have a question yet because we're going to take a short commercial break here on Critical Mass Radio Show. We have one more segment to go, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully you'll be able to stay with us for that. When we come back, I'm going to ask Will just to give us a sense for the arc of space travel, and some things that I've heard him talk about before, which is the number of people who've had the privilege to leave this beautiful thing called Earth and travel into space. This is our final segment. Uh, 
we're honored to have, in addition to Dean Salt, who is the Dean of California State University Long Beach Business School, we have Will Pomerantz, who is Vice President of Special Projects for Virgin Galactic. Will, before the break, I set it up by saying I was going to ask you just to give us a state for and kind of the arc of space travel. Just give us some context, please. Sure. Uh, well, I guess people have probably wanted to explore space since there have been people, right? I think you can find it in cave paintings. People are drawing the moon and drawing the stars, and uh, Jules Verne was writing about going to the moon, and, and there are examples going much farther back than that. It didn't become even remotely realistic until, uh, until the 20th century, and I won't bore you too much with a historical lecture, but uh, I find it pretty amazing that we started exploring space with satellites in 1957, October 4th, 1957, as Sputnik launches. launches. Uh, first human goes to space April 12th, 1961. So we've been exploring space for quite a long time. Um, and we made some incredibly rapid progress in the early days, right? You have uh, President Kennedy getting up before the American public and challenging us as a nation to put a human on the surface of the moon within a decade at a time when our total spaceflight experience as a species was measured in hours, right? And, and we did it, it, it happened. Um, and I think a lot of people, um, connected those dots and they just extrapolated that line or they said, oh, hey, maybe we're even on an exponential curve and they said, okay, we're, we're going to be, by the time we reach the future, you know, like 2015 or something, uh, everyone will have gone to space probably lots of times and we'll be living in 2001 A Space Odyssey or The Jetsons or Star Wars or Star Trek, you pick, pick your favorite one. Uh, that hasn't really happened. Um, a stat that I find both fascinating and for the most part crushingly depressing is that uh, as of today, if you add up every human who has ever been in space for even an instant in time, starting with Yuri Gagarin in 1961, going up through the crew of the International Space Station flying above our heads right now, the total number is 551. Um, you know, our, our live audience today was a pretty good chunk of that. Uh, and, and I find that just horribly small, horribly small. Uh, and for a long time I was really disappointed about that and felt like there wasn't anything I could do about it other than grumble, uh, you know, send nasty tweets if there had been Twitter back in those days. Um, but eventually I realized that it was, uh, fundamentally it's not NASA's job to increase that number by orders of magnitude, right? It was NASA's job and other space agencies' job to increase that number from zero to something greater than zero. And it continues to be NASA's job, and I hope it always will continue to be NASA's job, to, to keep raising that number by five or 10 or 20 a year. Right, these incredible, well-trained, highly skilled government astronauts going out on these truly inspiring missions of exploration. That's NASA's job. It's not NASA's job to say, well, Will Pomerantz dreamt of going to space as a young boy, so let's make it so. That would be very odd if that were the one thing that <laughs> Congress and the President could, could agree upon. Um, what has started to happen recently is, uh, is this division of labor I referred to uh, previously. It, it actually was mainly founded, interestingly enough, by um, people who got inspired by watching what NASA was doing and then went off and made a whole lot of money doing something totally different, uh, whether that's founding a, a record store and an airline or, or writing the software for PayPal or creating Amazon.com or creating the Extended Stay America hotel chain or whatever else. Uh, and they made a billion dollars or a couple billion dollars and they came back, well, you know, my first love was space, so uh, I'm just gonna give it a wing because now technology has allowed me to indulge my curiosity about this and, and, and go off and do that. Uh, so that's what we have happening now. NASA remains a strong organization. Like I said, its funding is essentially the same as it's always been if you adjust for inflation. And there are a few anomalous points in there at the tail end of the Apollo program, but for the most part, it's been, been always the same. But now we have a new source of funding. You know, probably most of you are familiar with the term of monopoly. Maybe fewer of, you are, uh, few, fewer of you are familiar with the term monopsony. It's sort of the same thing where there's only one customer instead of only one store. We were kind of a monops monopsony in this industry and a monopoly in this industry for, I don't know, the better part of 40 years. Now we have different customers. Uh, you know, in the case of my company, we've sold 700 tickets to space. I've got 700 different customers just for that one side of the business. Uh, and they enable me to do different things because they ask different things of me. Uh, and they are more consistent about some things and perhaps less consistent about other things. Um, but because we have this influx of money and this influx of enthusiasm and this influx of talent, and because we're doing a better job retaining talent, because it used to be if you had the experience I had where you went and did a summer internship at NASA and you decided it wasn't for you, that meant the whole industry wasn't for you because there was no other option. Now we're able to keep some of those young people because they say, okay, 
NASA wasn't for me, maybe planetary resources is. Maybe, a, you know, if a 10,000 person company doesn't suit my style, maybe a 10 person company does. Uh, because all those things are happening, we are now getting to the point where I, I think we are going to start to see, we are going to start to achieve that vision that so many of, uh, of our fellow countrymen and countrywomen had back in the 1960s. We're going to see that exponential growth curve where the number of, number of people who have been to space doesn't just keep going slowly plotting on the steady line, but starts to take that nice curve upwards. And we start to have not just 500 people going ever, but like 500 people going a year, and then 500 people going a season, and then 500 people going a week. Uh, and each of those things, like any other exponent, um, has wonderful trickle-down effects, where when you have lots more people going and they come from lots of different countries and lots of different demographic backgrounds, now all of a sudden they're going back into their community and they're not only speaking to every middle school student and inspiring them to study STEM careers, they're also going and they're speaking to their university administrators and to their city councilwoman and to their president and saying, we need to invest in these kinds of things, or oh, I had these great ideas, or oh, now that we can do this, this enables these 10 other things. Um, so I think the state of the industry is good. Um, like any other industry that's in a state of rapid change, there, it's fraught with peril. There are some risks. Um, there are some very good people who, through no fault of their own, are, uh, are hunting for jobs for the first time in 40 years because directions are changing. Uh, Paul Roberts, who owns OCTalkRadio.net, whispered in my ear, he wanted me to ask both of you, why is Southern California such a hotbed for this generation of space exploration? Uh, I, a pair of reasons. One is history. Um, a lot of it used to happen here, which meant a lot of the talent is here, a lot of the supply chain is here, a lot of the infrastructure is here. It's also just a nice place to live. Uh, so when you're Elon Musk and you've made a couple billion dollars and you want to start a space company, you can go anywhere you want. Um, it's a pretty good place to go. Um, so I, I think that that has a big part to do with it. Uh, I'm confident that the incredible education system in the state has a big part to do with that as well, because it means not only can I retract the, attract the, um, the gray-haired veterans from all over the world to come here, but I can count on like, keeping those chairs full with, uh, with curious and, and enterprising young people uh, as, as my company grows and, and the workforce ages, et cetera. Well, I, you know, the aviation um, business started by a couple of Buckeyes over 100 years ago, um, the Wright brothers. And I think they, they launched their plane on the uh, North Carolina coast. But if you look at the history Will was talking about, really the growth of aviation took place out here. Um, probably because of weather to some degree, the ability to put planes together year round, fly them year round, maybe had played a role in, in some part of that. Then once you have uh, a sort of a critical mass, you, you know, it sort of breeds on itself. You have the engineers, you have the suppliers, you have the, the knowledge and the technology. So I think it is that there's roots in the aviation industry here that go way back in Southern California that are providing like a platform for today's, uh, the next generation, the this, this space exploration. Excellent. Can we give them both a round of applause? <laughs> Will, I've got a question. You served for three years as the senior director of space prizes for X Prize, do I have that correct? Yeah. All right. Y you worked with both Google and NASA to award millions of dollars in prize money. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you share the role curiosity plays in that you observed in Google and sure. in NASA? Yeah. Um, what I was doing at, uh, at that time um, when I was working at the X Prize Foundation, what the X Prize Foundation does and did and still does uh, is this uh, actually in many ways kind of an ancient and under overlooked for a long time um, model of technology advancement called the incentive prize, which says that if I want to I want to achieve some technology goal, instead of going out and finding the smartest person and paying him or her and saying go work on this for a couple of years and come back and tell me what you did, uh, instead just put a big carrot at the end of a stick to the whole world and say I don't care who you are, I don't care where you went to school, what you majored in, what your grades were, I don't care how dumb your idea sounded the day before it worked. If you do this first, you get a big check. Um, so uh, so that, that has worked many years. A lot of the things that are most important to your life today, whether you know about them or not, actually came in many ways from incentive prizes. You know, um, The first uh, way that humans had to, uh, to calculate their longitude which saved like millions of lives and allowed people to explore continents came from an incentive prize. Uh, the first 
plane to fly across the Atlantic came from an incentive prize. The first commercial vehicle to fly to space came from an incentive prize. Uh, I got to run these two different prizes. Uh, uh, one was a $2 million prize for NASA and Northrop Grumman uh, that required people to, to test lunar landers here on Earth, so build these flying rockets. Uh, the other one's still ongoing. It's for commercial companies to land a robot on the surface of the moon. And, I'm very hopeful that it might actually be won by a privately funded team uh, in 2017, which isn't all that far off. Um, those prizes fundamentally would not work if people were not curious, because the way those prizes work almost always is by attracting people from other industries. If the people in the industry are already solving the problem, you don't need a prize. And there are more efficient ways to achieve those results. If you already know all the smart people who have any relevant knowledge in that field, you can just call them up and say, hey, please start working on this. Um, almost all of those prizes were won by people from totally outside of that field. Uh, you know, I mentioned the iconic, the, the first big incentive prize in many ways was this one to allow people to, uh, to solve the problem of, of finding their longitude when at sea. When that prize was created, we already had a way to find latitude at sea, and that was through the stars. It was through celestial navigation. So everyone figured, we know how to find latitude, it's through the stars. How do we find longitude? Obviously, it's through the stars. It's just a more complex way. So all the people who wrote the rules were astronomers. All of the judges were astronomers. All of the teams were astronomers, except for one guy who was a watchmaker. And which one do you think won? The watchmaker, of course. And it surprised people so much that they did not give him the prize until after he died and his son collected the prize. He proved that it worked. They said, I don't believe it. They said, go do it again. At this time, that meant he had to sail from the United Kingdom to, I think, Brazil and back. So that took him another five years. They still didn't believe it. He had to write all these papers. He had to do all these things. And it took like 20 years. Th that's how outside of a box an idea this was. If, if that guy, if John Harrison had not been curious about this problem, we would still be waiting to find a way to calculate our longitude because it basically is not possible through celestial navigation. Even with supercomputers and the Hubble Space Telescope, it's not good enough. It just doesn't mean anything. Uh, so we, we absolutely, all, that model thrives on curiosity. What a great answer. What? Did we all learn something tonight? There you go. There's the price of admission right there, ladies and gentlemen. Final question for both of you tonight to kind of bring it all home. What are your final thoughts on the power of curiosity in business and in one's career? Well, I think curiosity is something that starts with inside each person. So that's sort of what we bring to the game. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, so without curiosity, one will just be that cog in a machine, and cogs are not, are, seem to be worth less and less all the time. So I think having an active mind and, and you can hear from Will's path through life, he has a very active mind and takes some risk. And I think Will's been willing to try different things all along the way. So for the one questioner earlier, Leah, I think it's be very, very open, very, very willing to take risk and do it with optimism and, and confidence. Um, to sort of summarize it, it's, uh, if you think about like um, uh, an engine, it, automobile engine. It's the pistons that go up and down that make that automobile move. But it's the spark plug that fires the piston. And to me, curiosity is like the spark plug in each of our lives. So if we want to move forward, we need to have curiosity. Um, maybe we've all seen those Dos Equis commercials, <laughs> the most interesting man in the world. Well, you know, he says, stay thirsty, my friends. But he's always doing something great, interesting, and exciting, right? So I guess my thought to you all would be, if you want to have a great, exciting life and career, stay curious, my friends. <laughs> Boy, I, I hate to even say anything after that. That was such a good answer. Uh, this podcast brought to you by the good people now. Um, uh, I have had the good fortune in my career because I've, I've worked on a field that people are excited about. I've gotten to meet a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people who have started companies, many of whom have started you know, multiple companies, some of whom have made outrageous sums of money. Uh, and when I ask them about why they've started those companies and how they've started the companies, I found almost all of them uh, have a sequence of two emotions. It's first frustration and then it's curiosity. It's something happens to them in their lives that is fundamentally dissatisfying and they're saying, why the F did that happen that way? Why hasn't someone come up with something better? This stupid thing breaks every time I try. Why, 
Why doesn't someone, and then they get curious. Why doesn't someone do this? What if you did it this other way? And sometimes that leads nowhere because people have explored all the other branches on that tree and there are solid reasons why you don't do this. But a lot of times it's because no one else asked that question. Um, curiosity in business of any kind, whether it's being curious about a new type of food and starting a fusion restaurant or food truck, or it's being curious about why is it so dang expensive to put a greenhouse on Mars, which is the way Elon Musk started SpaceX. He wanted to put a greenhouse on Mars, and he discovered it was extraordinarily expensive. And he said, why is it so expensive? I can add up the cost for buying the rocket fuel. It's not that much. Why don't I just go and do the damn thing myself? Uh, I think that, that, that expression, why don't I go why don't I just go and do the damn thing myself, is like the, the founding charter of almost every successful startup out there. Uh, and and there's, a, there's a question mark, there's a curiosity embedded in that, in that statement. I need to ask everybody here in the audience to please give both of our panelists a rousing and yourself a round of applause. You've been listening to Critical Mass Radio Show. This is our college speaker series. Our guests today gave us a lot of content. Dean Salt. Uh, he is the Dean of the Business School here at Cal State University at Long Beach, and Will Pomerantz, who's Vice President of Special Projects for Virgin Galactics. I'm your host, Rick Franzi. I really appreciate those of you that stayed until the end and participated actively and learned, hopefully. Take what you've heard tonight from the, our panelists and from the questions that were asked by your peers and share it with at least two of your friends. Take that challenge tonight, whether it's over a cake at the homecoming party or wherever you might be going later this evening or this weekend, and keep this concept alive about being curious. And the other thing that I would ask is sample it yourself. Notice who in your network is a curious sort. Find those people who ask good questions. Learn that skill to ask good questions. Leaders ask great questions. Listen to the answer and figure out how to do something with what they've heard. The person who gives the response is now a part of the solution, and the best ideas are in your brains. Share them with others, ask the questions, be a curious person. Maybe someday when we're back here doing this in the future, we'll have the honor of having you as one of our panelists on this stage as well. So for everybody involved in this production tonight, I want to thank everybody with Cal State Long Beach. We'll thank you again. Paul Roberts, OC Talk Radio. Thank you all for staying. Good night. Good night to you in the audience. <laughs>